it's quite possible that servicers could dominate the top 10. Uh, really, I think for the for the first time in, in well, in mortgage history, the, 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 at least in my career since the 90s, it's an existential threat to IMBs, for IMBs who are not servicers. Hi, I'm Clayton Collins, CEO at Housing Wire, coming to you from the inaugural Housing Wire IMB Summit. My guest today for this episode of Powerhouse, which we're recording at the George W. Bush Library, is Mr. Rick Rock, Corporate EV of Strategy at NFM. Rick, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you. This is great. You, you've done, a, well, the whole Housing Wire staff, I think, has done an amazing job. Uh, again, I mean, you guys are really knocking it out of the park with these with these conferences. They're content rich. Uh, I, I do like the daily, the one day format. A number of us did come in last night and a number yep. of us are staying tonight. So I, I think that uh, you, you've come up with a really unique combination uh, to come out, to yield, I think, a pretty content rich conference. So the one day format thing is like, I, I one, I think it's an industry like need, but two, yeah. it's a little bit of like selfish priorities. Like I've kind of learned as, a, you know, the stage of my life and career, yeah. um, I need like, to be able to do 36 hour trips and like be able oh. to leave on a Monday morning, like do dinner conference <laughs> and then get out Tuesday night. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's part of having young kids at home. It's part of like being a CEO of a, a growing business. But, uh, and, and I, I, I hope that that like, there's like needs that I've kind of identified resonate with the, the attendees and the guests we're trying to serve of like quicker, quicker content. You know, I, I think people were skeptical at, at the one day as to whether yeah. or not there'd be enough value delivered in the day. Uh, just in the industry chatter. Uh, but I think you've delivered on it successfully a couple conferences now in a row. Yeah. Uh, that I think that that's, it's a good, it's a good recipe. And look, I'm, I'm a father of six kids, so I totally get it. And I appreciate the, you know, the, uh, content rich brevity. Yeah. I, I wonder if like, I mean, I, so we're probably have our housing wire economic summit. We're, we're going to February. And I'm thinking on that one, maybe and McKenna, who leads events, and Brenna are probably going to kill me on this. Maybe do like a a check in and welcome the night before, so it kind of has like that Monday evening or the evening before the event. There's like there's there's something to provide to to our guests that are traveling in. Yeah, that, that I think might like extend it out to a two day feel, but still like one day of stage time. Well, the the accounting is key, uh, so I think that's a really interesting uh, area of focus. I didn't know yeah. you were going to do a, an accounting conference. I'm sorry, yeah. economic summit. Or economic. Yeah, so oh, like, oh, just like, on the, econ the yeah, yeah. economic. Yeah, so yeah. So we're gonna bring um, oh, so like, so like like our team. So like Logan and yeah. Mike will like do like analysis and forecast, and we're gonna invite some of the chief economists from the industry in. So at that point, um, everyone will already have dropped their 2025 forecasts for mortgage origination volume and home sales and rates and all the other economic drivers. But we're probably at least of last year as a proxy have already done one revision to those yeah. numbers. So we're starting to get some clarity into what 2025 is going to look like, which is, um, you know, we're economic and data geeks at housing wire. So yeah. this one, uh, I think mean, we have enough audience members who have the same level of passion for the numbers. Well, and that and this we rely is, upon uh, you for yeah. it. Yeah. You know, I think the industry relies upon you for it. Even, even Shant uh, from guaranteed rate said that today. Yeah. He said he opens up his day you know, kind of de devouring the information that you guys put forward in order to churn that uh, yeah. to his referral partners to educate them because they don't have the time to do what we have the time to do ourselves. So it's music it's, it's to valuable. my ears when I like hear people like like Sean did today talk about what he does with yeah. information from Housing Wire. That's literally why we exist. Like we don't hope that people like read Housing Wire and then just internalize and never talk about it. Like I want to serve leaders like you yeah. and Sean with knowledge and information that you in turn can share with your production teams and referral oh, yeah, and partners staff. and staff, staff across the organization. And, yeah. um, we know, we know, we know that every like, you know, closer and processor is not going to stay up to date on industry news every single yeah. day. Some do, but like, that is what we hope is to empower leaders to lead their teams and make better decisions. Well, look from a leadership standpoint, to be honest, it, it, uh, the, the economic data creates context for people's day to day yep. jobs. And so, and a lot of loan officers, I mean, you know, uh, we have, we have about 600 employees or so, most of which are, are loan officers. Uh, and they don't necessarily, they're, they're the hustle and bustle of trying to get deals. They're not necessarily taking as much time to pause. No loan officer really yep. for the most part does take the moment to, to sort of pause, digest the data, understand what, what it means for my realtor, what it means for my, my consumer. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then boil that into their practice. 
So as, as leaders, we need to do that ourselves. And, and quite frankly, um, you guys, the housing wire, you know, makes our jobs significantly easier by, by enabling accessibility yeah. to that data. Because without which we'd be flying in as much in the dark as our loan officers and our staff members are. Let me ask you something. So you mentioned Shot's um, presentation. Yeah. Shot is, uh, leads a very large part of rate, yeah. formerly yeah. guaranteed rate. Up billion in, dollar plus yeah. Uh, yeah. group. And uh, he talked about leveraging housing economics data and analysis and forecasts to educate his team and clients. But he also talked about like avoiding the things you can't control. Yeah. And we can't control interest rates. We can't control inventory. So how do you think about the balance of, of knowledge of like when you talk to your team about things they can't control and when you just try to focus them in on like the basics or the, the fundamentals that they can actually impact. Yeah, you know, one of the quotes that that uh, Shot had made um, either at this one or another conference I saw him speak at was that you can't control the market, but you can control your market share, right? Yep. And his focus just zeroed in on the activities and the behaviors uh, and then the systems around it to drive the activities and the behaviors to serve his referral partners, to be able to serve his consumers uh, and, and irrespective of rate, right? Because yeah. the, the rate is the rate and 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 at some, there's market dynamics around, you have to be at least commensurate or have some parity with, with, with the rates at which the competitors are delivering 100%. to the market. But when it comes to like the headline news, there's so much um, despair that loan officers can almost have when they rely so much on headlines that they almost don't understand or, or, or rate talking points yep. that they simply don't know how to turn into new business for themselves. So she had, I think hit the nail, hit the nail on the head, but really hit it out of the park. Yeah. And like, we'll, I want to move on and talk about some of the other like takeaways from the yeah. events, but I'll, I'll give one, one last call out on shot, which is a presentation. I think we both enjoyed a lot is where he shared that he wasn't, he wasn't born with the uh, uh, DNA or athletic prowess to be a professional athlete, but he considers yeah. himself a professional athlete. His choice, his sport of choice is mortgage. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, I loved that. Like, like just you know, bringing in like the the focus and dedication and training and coaching that comes that we all know comes of being a great athlete. Those same, same things apply here when you try yeah. to play at a really high level in a competitive industry. The one thing, well, he's a big Boston sports fan. He's a big Pats fan, and the one thing he focused on with that Tom Brady does and did, you know, when he played was really focusing on the tape, like run yeah. the tape, you know, and he and he does that with uh, his his loan officers where he records the conversations. Uh, he makes them, you know, role play, he creates scripts for them based on mar the market data. Uh, and he ensures that they can deliver succinctly and swiftly to the consumer. So yep. that it's intelligent. It's more uniform across a very large team. Um, and, and you can control the message that way. Uh, he controlling the, I mean, running the tape, watching the tape is such a good skill that loan officers, salespeople hate, he, like practicing anything. They just want to do everything on the job. And um, and you can't do it that way. Really yeah. top performing sales professionals like Sean um, go into these things well rehearsed. And I'm telling you, his presentation today was so tight and so well delivered. You can tell that he just didn't get up there and wing it. Oh, he mentioned me backstage and he was on vacation last week and he spent the whole flight home like rehearsing. His wife's like, what are you doing? You never do this. He's like, let me, let me get it right. No, it's oh. it's it's look, he's the best emulator of the best practices that he expects from his sales team. And that's, look, that's the struggle for any leader is yeah. to be able to kind of refine your own practice so that, so that others can sort of benefit and learn from it and emulate it as well. And you just hope that those practices are positive ones. Cause if they're negative, <laughs> then, then the, the yeah. opposite effect occurs and you get sort of a toxic negative culture. But so Rick, let's jump forward. So you've been, uh, here all day, uh, listening yeah. in on sessions, networking, what are other key themes that you've seen kind of popping from our speakers on stage or other conversations you're yeah. having at the event? So Taylor, uh, Stork, the, um, the founder, he's a head of a uh, director's mortgage, yep. uh, but founder of the, um, is it, was it community or home lenders association of America? Exactly. CHLA. Uh, yeah. And then he spoke with Paulina McGrath, who yeah. also leads a, a lender and is part of CHLA as well, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And I think she was, I think she's, she was based in Houston, Texas. Yep. And, um, and you know, it, it, part of, there's so much change going on and I, I really admire Taylor's efforts in, um, in lobbying for the interest of the industry, uh, in a way where it can drive, 
positive chain for the consumers, but it also protects our interests from the standpoint of just efficiency um, and, and just management, but or policy management. But he had, they were just talking about the, how uncertain the market is right uh-huh. now. There's so many things that are changing between, not, I mean, the election is the big elephant. Yeah. You, know, you sort of know pet intended on, on the Republican side, but um, you, you have the elephant in the room and you have the donkey in the rail, right? Uh, and, and so, you know, I think the net discussion was the fact that there are really, in some ways, we don't know what's going to change. Uh, there's a number of different proposals that are sort of in contrast with between with what Trump would do uh, with respect to housing and what Vice President Harris would do. But at the same time, there's a, a ambiguity around what could happen yeah. and what we don't know what will happen. Uh, and then there's kind of a sense that like it really there's probably not a lot's going to change on either side of the fence. So it, but but that's but that's yeah. the challenge that like we're all sitting there scratching our heads trying to figure out how do we prepare Um is it much ado about nothing? There'll be some tweaks and nuances to the housing markets, or it'll be pretty dramatically, the changes could be pretty dramatic. So, um, so, so this afternoon, Bob Brokesmith, who leads yeah. the Mortgage Bankers Association, is going to take the stage and talk about his interpretation of how different election outcomes could impact the housing industry. And while I know we can't predict the election right now, it's not a game I want to get into, um, I am interested in hearing Bob's perspectives on what housing looks like in the next administration. Yeah. Um, but when we go back at Housing Wire and look at the data, we see that the election rarely has any impact at all on yeah. the housing industry, yeah. except in scenarios where big first time home buyer programs come yeah. into market and are actually effective. And that well, was in and, Mike and Simonson's where, data this morning. Look, Vice President Harris might might be onto something in the sense of if there if there is a catalyst to that, yeah. uh, even if it's um, more of a marketing push where sometimes as, as, as policy and programs get sort of mucked in through government, it doesn't tend to have the net impact. But I think just having the conversation, bring awareness to it, could itself have its own impact on first-time home buying activity. Um, but can, can I hit on a word? Yeah, you just said you yeah. said net impact. And I think yeah. that's a really important word. So in Mike Simonson's presentation this morning, he talked about purchase volume, percentage growth and percentage declines over the last 20 years. And he spotlighted two years in history. And I'm not going to quote him because I don't remember him exactly, but where we had big growth years, like eight, nine, 10% in purchase volume, followed by a um, a down year in purchase volume growth. And those were, they weren't because we had an economic recession on the down year. It was because there was some program that pulled forward volume. So yeah. like it, like, Hey, if without the programs, nine, 10, 11, 12 would have been steady growth. You throw some programs in there and like the market does this. Yeah. And uh, so I think net's an important word because yeah. you might not actually be bringing new homeowners into the housing yeah. market. Well, we want we might effective- just be changing the timing of when that's going to happen. We just want effective policies that, that yeah. are going to stimulate that kind of growth. Um, I, I do think that the state level DP programs in grants and uh, even down to the county levels are often deeply underfunded. Yes. So it could be, so my hope to some degree is that there's sort of a hybrid solution where there could be a federal grant that's channeled in through existing DPA programs. I mean, there's several hundred DPA programs across the country yeah. uh, that that often end up running out of funds or there's just a lack of education around them. I think if all of a sudden these programs are were in essence backed uh, by the federal government and and so that they will so they don't locally run out of money, um, I think there could be a tremendous amount yeah. of lift. And I'm like, I'm always reminded as a podcast host of Powerhouse that our audience is diverse. And oh, here yeah. at, the, at the IMB Summit, we can use our analogies or our acronyms all day long. Um, DPA, Down Payment Assistance Program. Yeah. So we'll define some acronyms as we go. As yeah, we go through no, no, this. fair, fair, fair. <laughs> no, look, the, the Down Payment Program, and this is why um, Crib Equity is here with yeah. with with with, um, with Sky, who's the founder of Crib Equity. Like, I mean, when we His were on our, our 5K run this morning, that guy flew oh, by. Dude, he me. runs like 630 miles. He's nuts. <laughs> um, but but why I think he's solutions like his are so important is that they solve a, a pretty critical um, piece of that puzzle. Uh, and that is just a, helping consumers jump the hurdle yeah. of the down payment, right? With appreciation of home values, um, with credit card debt high as high as, as, as it is. Uh, and auto loan debt as high as it is, and yeah. the monthly auto loan payment as high as it is for consumers, uh, there's just not a lot of latitude, right, to be able to, for savings for uh, a down payment. And so uh, so solutions like, I think, 
crib equity, I think it, are very powerful in solving that problem. So I was yeah. glad to see him here. Excellent. Okay. So we talked about Sean's talk time yeah. on stage. We talked about Taylor and Paulina. Have there been any other themes or speakers that pop out to you kind of in, look, the, in the first half of the content? Today? Yeah, no, look, I see uh, Jeremy Potter did a, a good session with the CEO and founder of, of Silk yeah, Time. Mark Trockenberg. Uh, you know, those of us in the, in the, in the, in the auditorium were, were saying, we're joking that Jeremy was making, t you know, title sexy again. Uh, I think that, Look, title is is ripe for innovation, yeah. right? It's ripe for efficiency, um, and and so there's an opportunity in title, both in tech, uh, companies like Title Genius and other type title solutions to really reduce the cost to the consumer, uh, either reducing unnecessary searches uh, or algorithmically assigning risk uh -huh. to the title transaction, and then a, a sort of assigning a cost to that risk which often will be lower by several hundred dollars a transaction, which in, a, in essence makes the transaction far more affordable to the consumer. Um, Jeremy's an expert at, at the title tech side, um, but I, I only mentioned Title Genius because I know Radian has, you know, acquired the company and they're doing an incredible job at actually like trying to streamline the communication between the realtor, the consumer, and the yep. loan officer all within one sort of closing title experience. Um, and I think they're, they're net... Uh, they have some, they quote some rate uh, at which that they save the consumer on average, something to the effect of like $400 or $350 in savings per transaction, uh, which look, a lot of consumers are, are scraping pennies just to, just to, you know, to meet the, the costs of closing. And I think anything that they can do or that can be yeah. done to, to make that more affordable uh, is a good step in the right direction. So can you help from your vantage point as a, a mortgage banking leader yeah. tie the relevancy of why we have title on stage at this or that and like what it means to to folks in the audience i think or, what's or well, not no it's, well it's it, it is what's funny is title in closing I, I was mentioning this to another title vendor title in closing tends to be sort of a, a service you sort of take for granted yeah and you almost ignore that it's there it just sort of happens right um and uh, but because so much of our work is is done on the front end, that there's so much innovation uh, being focused and money being focused on yeah. providing efficiencies in the front end, that the back end improvements tend to get ignored, right? Um, it, it was definitely the case pre-COVID. I felt yeah, like closing 100%. the title got just like sucked into the innovation conversation yeah. when we couldn't go. Well, because all of a sudden it became the constraint, Yeah, right? Yeah. When, when the demand was there, it became the constraint. So. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's absolutely relevant. Uh -huh. Um, and, and I think it's a, a real low hanging fruit for the right forward thinking lender, uh, to really look at this type, this closing experience and then partner with the right sort of next generation title sort of technology. Yeah. Uh, and I think Jerry Potter, he's a consultant to the business. He's probably one of the best consultants that I've, that I've worked with, um, because of his experience in law and technology and innovation. Um, and, um, and just the operating, operating yep. workflow, the mortgage. Um, so it's, it's, it's absolutely relevant. I mean, you got to look at the entire value chain of the mortgage from when the consumer starts to prepare to qualify for a loan, um, all the way to not just after at closing, but in the months and maybe even the years after closing, um, to be able to, to be able to add as much value throughout that chain as you can. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Any other like key themes well, no, or I mean, I, you want to talk about? I, I, I'd be remiss to uh, to forget Greg Shares' presentation yeah. this afternoon on uh, what, what was his title? The, the power he, of he's, social. He's talk, yeah, he's talking about building community. Yeah. 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 So so Greg's coming up this afternoon. I have the pleasure of interviewing Mike Dubeck from Planet yeah. Home Lending, and they yeah. you know they just did their Axia deal or yeah. Building no, out, Planet Planet building has a tremendous amount of opportunity. You yeah. Know? Uh, they have one of the largest servicing portfolios in the in the industry. Uh, and, and they have a lot of cash, you know? Yeah. So, so uh, it was interesting. A lot of us in the retail side saw this acquisition of Axia um, and, it, and it kind of made us pause to say, this is a, a real heavyweight that potentially could do some damage uh, in the retail market space uh, if they really decided to, right? They did, they've just always been a servicer and kind of a streamlined yeah. shop to really sort of drive their production volume by servicing their servicing clients. Um, but if they really took retail aggressively in the front end, they could give a lot of mortgage companies a run for their money for sure. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. That'll be a great conversation. Yeah. So Rick, you're in a, a new role at NFM. Yeah. You're, you're here absorbing and networking. 
what do you look forward to in the next um in, in q4 or out into 2025 like where's your energy going and what are you most excited so about? my my energy is focused strictly really on growth in yeah. driving um my interest is talking to companies that are doing 250 million a half yeah. a billion a billion maybe a billion five a year in production volume and assessing whether or not they want to make the investments in technology and in AI uh -huh. and other things to scale or to be able to partner with a lender like NFM uh, to to leverage our economy of scale um, and, uh, and, to, and to still continue to grow, right, without so much of the risk. So I think companies like NFM are going to be, are significantly advantaged because of our, uh, our, our current sort of market circumstance yep. of Fannie, Freddie, Ginny, and of course our investments in technology uh, we're going to be able to double our production volume. We'll do probably seven billion or so this year, and we'll probably we can double our production volume by probably only adding about twenty five percent or so of additional back office related expenses because of the efficiencies that we've put into our technology. And what does that translate to companies that can potentially work with us? It translates those those are expenses that that pickup we're going to collect as a company. We could share that with companies that end up joining us and fall underneath our umbrella. So we have amazing leadership. We have an amazing founder um, and really stable operating leadership. So it's it's um, so that's that's where my focus is. I'm really happy you brought up leadership. That's one of the key themes at this event today. And I yeah. in my opening remarks, I and I thought about this a lot. It's like what matters most to this group, and that is an, a mortgage industry with leaders driving us forward. And yeah. I believe that the folks in the room are the leaders who will help define and lead the mortgage market forward. If they're not already in that seat, they are ready to take that seat. Yeah. And it's really cool to start to see the next generation of corporate and production leadership yeah. really step up into what we believe and most of our speakers believe is a pretty big market opportunity that's going to come in the next several years. Oh yeah. Yeah. But it, the only caveat I'd make to that is, is that to make, to ensure that the results there, there's kind of like leadership driven results drive change in the yeah. industry. Right. So when you have like someone like Sh Shant, who clearly based on the metrics is not just a leader because of, of leadership's sake, he's a leader by the numbers. Yeah. He's a leader through efficiency. He's a leader by the, by through the metrics. And there's a lot of companies. I think there's good companies that are doing three, four billion a year. Uh, there are good companies doing a billion a year. Um, that I think that uh, that based on the merits in their numbers, respective rel relative to their scale, um, are going to be very successful in a de you know growing market share. Um, you know, there's you know I met a handful of companies today that were uh, in that 500 million to a billion yeah. a year space that I think that they're asking themselves the question: uh, Do I put the capital in play yeah. to kind of build ourselves up or do we work with a company like NFM uh, or other or other top lenders who could potentially absorb that kind of volume uh, into a new partner in this yeah. next phase? And that was the like the interesting part of putting this agenda together is trying to, to serve a wide range of independent mortgage banks yeah. and, and aspiring bankers yeah. from all from all sizes. And it's easy if we want to you know, stack the, the stage and stack the audience with folks from the, the top 10 on the lenders, but there's a big group of small IMBs who wants to learn, want to learn from the folks who are already in the seat that one day they aspire to get to. And yeah. uh, so I like the fact that the audience in the stage represented, um, you know, folks from sub billion yeah. and tens of billions. Well, one nugget for you is that, you know, we, we look at over the last 15 years, uh, you know, the, the, the makeup of the top 25 always sort of the pendulum swung between depositories and non-depositories, yep. right? Um, this third emerging category are, are now just purely servicers, Ser service-driven, servicer-driven originations yep. that are driving these large servicers into the top 10. And now I, it, it's, quite, it's quite possible that servicers could dominate the top 10, uh, really, I think, for the, for the first time in, 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 well, in mortgage history, that, 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 at least in my career since the 90s, such an important topic. And yeah. I think KP, Kevin Pranio brought yeah. that up in the last session before lunch is um, we don't necessarily want to overestimate the impact of a potential refi market on the originator because these servicers are ready yeah. to service that servicing portfolio, retain borrowers, and they didn't do all these acquisitions of MSRs just to watch them march out the door. 
the second a new originator calls yeah. them. Well, one of the stats that um, the fair your the presentation by Fairway Tyler Tyler, yeah, Tyler this yeah. morning he had mentioned that eighty percent of and maybe it was a uh, a um, a NAR stat uh-huh. uh, a National Association of Realtors stat that eighty percent of consumers mm-hmm. go with the first lender they speak to you um, and they engage with around qualifying for a mortgage. And if that's true, if I'm a servicer and I've really streamlined that digital experience, not only to, on the refinance side, but if I'm also monitoring their credit and monitoring yep. their purchase behavior, um, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm detecting that they're in the market for a purchase for a purchase opportunity, and then all of a sudden I'm getting a notification when I go to per- when I go to pay my my mortgage using yep. the app, I get a notification proactively about low rates for a for a new purchase product. All of a sudden, if I make that phone call, if that statistic is true, and I have no reason to doubt it, then all of a sudden the servicers are in the purchasing game. And the and servicers they, and they never are, have been. They're working with new digital platforms that are yeah. just much easier for the consumer to interact with. Even oh, yeah. five, six years ago, like technology has taken steps forward. So, yeah. Rick, it, that's, it's, it's an existential stra- threat to IMBs for IMBs who are not servicers. You know, in a, a true existential threat. IMBs who are not servicers, they should be watching this very carefully uh, because it's it, it's going to eat the market share in, in ways we've never seen in the business. Damn, feels like that's a session we should have had on the agenda this afternoon. Yeah. To do it next time. Yeah. Rick, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank hey, you man. for joining us here at the George yeah, Bush Great show. job. I'll use our powerhouse platform for a quick thank you to our Housing Wire events team. McKenna Clay put on an excellent event. Sarah Wheeler, amazing agenda. Diego Sanchez, thank you for all of your efforts and bringing out an amazing group of attendees. Everyone else at Housing Wire is contributing here today to help make this event a success. I appreciate you and the attendees that I've spoken to appreciate you as well. So thank you very much. Have a great day.